panic started to spread and the streets started to fill with people and carts trying to move possessions away from this fire that was determinedly making its way through the city. Hello everyone, welcome to this episode. We're going to focus on the Great Fire of London of 1666. In the early hours of 2nd September 1666, fire broke out in a bakery on Pudding Lane in the city of London. Four days later, three quarters of the city had been destroyed and tens of thousands of people were homeless. So before we get on to the details of the fire, let me first, for anyone who isn't sure what the city of London is, first outline to you exactly what I mean by the City of London. And the City of London is what we call a square mile. It's the Roman, uh, or it used to be um, surrounded by a Roman wall. Uh, it is the City of London. So um, places you may know in the City of London, Tower of London, St Paul's Cathedral, they are all within the City of London. And in 1666, that small area had a population of 100,000 people. Death rate outstripped birth rate, but immigration meant that the population continued to grow. People were living in cramped conditions, which meant disease spread quite easily. In 1665, it had been a major, or there had been a major plague outbreak. And now in 1666, following a very hot, long, dry summer, and fire was about to take over the city. Overall, 436 acres of the city, about 13,200 buildings and 87 parish churches were destroyed. Tens of thousands of people were made homeless. Now it's because of the diarist Samuel Pepys that we understand how events unfolded. And he lived in the city of London, he obviously kept a diary, uh, and uh, you can access that online. This is a great website which has digitised his um, his diaries, so you can you can look up it, all sorts. He he actually was witness to quite a few events, uh, but the Great Fire of London being a significant one. At three o'clock in the morning on the second of September, sixteen sixty six, Pepys was asleep at his home in Seething Lane, near to the Tower of London. He was awoken by his maidservant who said that she had seen a great fire in the city. He went to his window to have a look for himself, but he thought the fire, fire was far enough away not to be too concerned. Now, fires were not unusual in the city, and so Pepys decided to go back to bed. Most of the buildings in the city at the time were made of timber, so made of wood, and the main source of light was candles. So it wasn't unusual for fires to break out. Now, of course, there's no firefighting service at this time. Um, so it was usual for people to organize themselves and they'd use whatever methods that were available to them to stop a fire. The most effective method that they found was creating a fire break. They would pull down unaffected buildings. Very, um, you know, very good for stopping the fire. Not so good, obviously, if it's your house that's uh, or business premises that has been pulled down, but there you go. So Peeps was woken up at 3 a.m. by his maidservant. He decided to go back to bed, but by 7 a.m. his maidservant was reporting back to him that over 300 houses had now been consumed by the fire and that the fire was continuing to burn. You now had thick smoke filling the streets, rolling down the narrow lanes, it was carried on quite strong winds. The embers from the fire were hot on the wind and Peeps, after taking a walk around, he wrote down, with one's face in the wind, you were almost burned with a shower of fire drops. It was with the aid of this wind that the fire had quickly become out of control. These flakes of fire, like Peeps described, would fly through the air, jumping five or six houses. On the first day of the fire, the Lieutenant of the Tower of London reported to Peeps that the fire had begun in the bakery of Thomas Farriner on Pudding Lane. Now, Thomas Farriner's bakery uh, was a sort of larger shop because it had the shop at the front, it had living quarters, and it had the ovens at the back. So actually, where the ovens were sited is on modern day Monument Street. Hannah Farriner, 
Thomas Farriner's daughter had been in the bakery at around midnight to get a light for her candle and reported nothing untoward. But only an hour later, at around 1am, Thomas Farriner's son, another Thomas, reported that the ground floor was in flames. The family escaped through an upstairs window onto a neighbouring roof. All followed except their maidservant, who was too frightened to do that. She, whose name, and we don't know her name, was the first victim of the Great Fire. The bakery, less than an hour later, was totally consumed by flames. The family raised the alarm and church bells began to ring to alert people to the danger. The missed opportunity to prevent the fire from getting worse earlier on in its outbreak fell squarely on the shoulders of the Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth. Famously, when the fire was reported to him, he'd quite crudely remarked, a woman may piss it out. Now, it seems that Bloodworth was not willing in the initial stages to create the fire breaks to pull down buildings. Thomas Bloodworth appears to have been influenced by his need for political support. The buildings that would need to have been brought down to create fire breaks in the early stages of the fire were owned by some of the most influential and wealthy landowners in the city. At the beginning of the first day, Pepys had taken in the possessions of a friend, but by the end of that day, he was looking for a place to move his things to. Panic started to spread and the streets started to fill with people and carts trying to move possessions away from this fire that was determinedly making its way through the city. People who had been paralysed by disbelief or panic now mobilised quickly and decided they had to get out. The streets started to fill the sound of the timbers cracking, the winds bringing through the smoke and the embers. It was chaos. Church bells had been ringing across the city to warn of danger, but as they were consumed by fire, they fell silent. If you're interested in the Great Fire of London and you'd like to do a walking tour, either virtually or if you can get to London uh, with your feet on the ground, then you may be interested to know that I have a walking tour on the Hidden Histories app. You can download it for Android and for iOS. There had been no significant rainfall since the previous November. And so we're in September, so this is a good sort of 10 months of hardly any rainfall. They're timber buildings, they're dry, and now fire is taking hold and the winds are beginning to whip up. Now, timber framed buildings will have what they call wattle and daub in between the, the, the frame. And the, the wattle is sort of um, a mesh of, uh, of wood and the daub is like a plaster. When those wattle and daub frames are in good condition, they are extremely fireproof. However, if the daub has uh, any cracks in it or any gaps in it, then the wood inside can ignite. So how was the fire put out? We already know that there was hardly any water in the city, the timber frame buildings were dry, and the winds were whipping up. Well, the fire had started on the 2nd of September and it finally died down on the 5th of September, four days it had been ravaging the city. Charles II had put his brother, James Duke of York, the future James II, in charge and they had started to use gunpowder to make fire breaks. It was quicker and they could make a larger hole between where the fire was and where it hadn't yet reached. They proved effective, but also key to this was the winds started to die down. Eventually, on the 9th of September, rain began to pour onto the city, finally putting out the last of the embers of the fire. So you may wonder what happened to the two buildings I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this video, the Tower of London and St Paul's Cathedral. Well, the Tower of London just about escaped which is a good job because that is where the armories were that was where gunpowder was kept if the fire had reached there we may not have a tower of london today to go and visit but saint paul's cathedral was not as lucky 
St Paul's Cathedral was the fourth cathedral standing on that site that ever had been called St Paul's Cathedral. And there probably had been a Roman temple on that site before that, a holy place. And there was renovation work going on at the cathedral. Now I've already talked about these embers that were in the air carrying the fire and setting light to buildings. Well St Paul's Cathedral was thought to be pretty safe. It had space around it and in fact the book sellers of Paternoster Row had stored their books in the crypt of the cathedral believing that they would be safe there. However that is not how it worked out. The embers are carried on the wind set fire to the scaffolding um, and lead melted from the roof. It poured down the pillars and actually cracked the pillars and St Paul's itself was engulfed in flame and was destroyed by the fire. Now, of course, we have Wren's beautiful St Paul's Cathedral with its famous dome and Wren was responsible along with, with his team for the rebuilding of many, many of the city's churches and buildings. In 1666, Christ Hospital, which was a school which had been given a charter by Edward VI for poor people's children to go and get an education. Here, children would board, they would be cared for and educated. Most of the school's buildings were burnt down during the fire, but mercifully, no children were harmed. Now, if you had been stood here on the 6th of September, 1666, your eyes would have been met by utter devastation. The buildings around you, once homes, workplaces, prisons, churches, you know, city institutions were all reduced to piles of smouldering rubble. The chaos, noise and panic of the last few days now gave way to a desperate, exhausted quiet. While the children went elsewhere to be educated and cared for, generous donations made it possible to rebuild the, the school and the church. The architect was Sir Christopher Wren and the church he built here was second largest in the city only to St Paul's Cathedral and it stood here until 1940 when it was victim to a bomb during the Blitz. The Great Fire of London goes some way to explaining why if you visit the city of London today it doesn't really look very old despite being one of our oldest cities but of course most of the buildings went about three quarters of the city was destroyed and then after that, the building regulations were much stricter. Now the road plan or the street plan, should I say, is very similar because despite there being many uh, plans put in, including by Wren himself and other leading architects of the day to have uh, a new sort of layout for the city and more open um, layout, green spaces, things like that, at the end of the day, landowners, land ownership issues got in the way and we have pretty much the same street plan as we did before the fire, albeit the buildings are very different. So if you want to go and explore the Great Fire of London either virtually or in real life then you can download the Hidden Histories app. You can download the app for free, the walking tours on there are on there for a small cost. But if you're going on the trail of the Great Fire of London without that, please make sure you go and see the monument. Monument would have been visible to people all the way around it when it was uh, put up. Now it is kind of engulfed, well it is engulfed, <laughs> not kind of, it is engulfed by the surrounding buildings and you kind of get a fleeting glance of it from the river if you take uh, one of the boats. Um, obviously if you go and walk down Pudding Lane or Monument Street you will see Monument and that was a monument it's not to the fire it's to the rebuilding of the city of the resilience of the city of the country and on top is a golden urn to represent the fire it was designed by uh, a scientist Robert Hooke of course under the supervision of Sir Christopher Wren and it was cited or it is cited on the uh, site of the first church to have been destroyed by the fire St Margaret's. Like I say, if you want to explore the Great Fire of London with me in far more detail, have a look at the walking tour on the Hidden Histories app, Great Fire of London. It's narrated by myself, so hopefully if you enjoy my voice, <laughs> then you don't mind the fact that I'm going to be talking to you for quite a while. And you can do it virtually, um, even if you can't go to London at the moment and do it in person. But hopefully one day soon we will.
Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed that. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you all soon. Thank you.